Good afternoon. My name is Paul Ryer, the director of SAR's Scholar Programs, and I am so pleased to welcome you today to uh, the 2020 William K. William Y. and Nettie K. Adams Fellowship Salon. Before I begin, a couple of simple housekeeping things. Uh, please check the SAR calendar for upcoming events. Um, and, uh, and then in terms of today's event, um, first I'm going to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Nicholas Barron, and then uh, we will hear his presentation. And following his presentation, SAR President Michael Brown and I will join Dr. Barron and we will take questions from the audience. So please, if at any point during his talk, a question comes to mind, please go to the um, chat, to the Q&A bar in the chat of your webinar screen and uh, type in your question. We will answer as many of those as possible. Occasionally, if there are two very similar questions, we may have to combine them into one. But uh, those questions will be welcome following the presentation, which will be about uh, 35 or 40 minutes long. So um, it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Nicholas Barron, the 2020 SAR Adams Fellow in the History of Anthropology. Um, his talk today titled Recognition in Unexpected Places, the Yaqui Indians, and the 89th Winter Grand Symposium. Dr. Barron is also the author of Assembling Enduring Peoples, Mediating Recognition in History and Anthropology, published in 2019. And he is a, graduate, a PhD graduate of the University of New Mexico. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nicholas Barron. Thank you. Hello. So uh, my talk today will touch on several themes which I explore in my forthcoming book, Applying Anthropology and Assembling Community. Uh, but I'd actually like to begin today uh, the talk with just uh, two photographs, which I hope that you'll be seeing on the screen here. On the left, you have the Regal Berg Bortenstein Castle nestled in the Austrian Alps. And on the right, you have a recreational center located on the Pascua Pueblo Yaqui Reservation, home to the federally recognized Pascua Yaqui tribe of Arizona. Now, both the photos date from around the same time period, the 1960s. However, I don't think it would be too controversial to suggest that the photos capture very different structures in very different places. The castle is a castle. The original structure was built in the 12th century. And after several expansions, the estate came under the ownership of the royal family of Liechtenstein in the late 19th century. The imposing facility essentially served as a hunting lodge for Prince Franz I until the rise of the Third Reich. The recreational center is not a castle. It's a recreational center. It was built in the 1960s by the descendants of Yaqui Indians who relocated from northern Mexico to Arizona in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Again, very different structures, very different places. And yet these two images and the locations they capture are loosely connected. In late November of 1981, an assortment of academics and tribal representatives gathered for the 89th International Symposium hosted by the Wenerbrand Foundation, a leading funder of anthropological research in North America. Previous symposia had been held at the aforementioned Berg Vortenstein Castle, which the foundation actually purchased in 1957. However, the 89th gathering was to be held in Southern Arizona, split between the aforementioned Pasco Pueblo Yaqui Reservation, also known as New Pasqua, and a conference center located north of Tucson. Organized around the theme of Yaqui ritual and performance, the event promised a public reenactment and interdisciplinary examination of the deer dance, a key component of the Yaqui ceremonial system. While largely comprised of leading figures in anthropology, the participant list also included noted representatives of the Pasqua Yaqui community on whose land the event would take place. An almost a forgotten event in a seemingly out of the way place, the Yaqui conference, as I'll refer to it from here on, became an unexpected site for what has been termed the politics of recognition. Now, the politics of recognition is itself a pithy phrase that simplifies a very complex phenomenon it seeks to describe. 
more precisely what is meant by the politics of recognition typically is the tensions that surround the acknowledgement of cultural difference within liberal democracies. As Charles Taylor has described, the primacy of the individual that is core to liberal democracies is on some basic level inhospitable to the recognition of collective difference that multiculturalism demands. Now, despite this inhospitality that Taylor describes since the 1970s, if not earlier, liberal democracies such as the United States have increasingly moved toward a kind of liberal multiculturalism in which the political rights of historically marginalized peoples are waged in the name of collective identity rights. In the context of Native North America, this tends to take the form of highly formalized governmental proceedings. The exemplary case being the federal acknowledgement process in the United States, in which applicants must conform to legally mandated, largely non-indigenous conceptions of what constitutes a legitimate American Indian tribe. Now, I'm less concerned with evaluating the validity of recognition, rather I'm concerned with how the dynamics of recognition exceed official governmental spaces and flow into unexpected terrains, including the rarefied air of the academy and its associated institutions and rituals, such as conferences. At the time of the Yaqui Conference, the Yaqui Indians of Southern Arizona were in a state of significant political flux having just achieved federal recognition as an American Indian tribe in 1978, so just a few years before the conference was held. Yaqui recognition was a hard-won and complex campaign consistent with the rise of indigenous identity movements and recognition-based politics within and beyond the United States. That being said, recognition of the Yaqui came with its own unique set of complications. The modern-day Pascual Yaqui tribe of Arizona is composed of the descendants of individuals who came to the American Southwest largely in the late 19th and early 20th centuries by way of the push of Mexican state violence as well as the pull of railroad and agricultural work. Those who braved the new landscape arrived in multiple ways and never lived in a single area. Migration along agricultural and railroad lines scattered Yaqui individuals and families into ethnically mixed neighborhoods from Northern Arizona to Southern California. Arriving from numerous villages in Sonora, a contingent of the displaced and heterogeneous Yaqui steadily aggregated into a small neighborhood in the northwest corner of the developing city of Tucson. In honor of the group's elaborate Easter ceremonial system, the community was given the name Pasqua, Spanish for Easter, by a local U.S. attorney and chair of the Chamber of Commerce, who actively supported the cultivation of the Pasqua Yaquis as an ethno-tourist attraction. Despite finding a home in urban Tucson, the community long occupied an uncertain position, sometimes classified as Mexican refugees, American Indians, and on at least one occasion, colonists. Pascuayaki identity was surprisingly porous, and at least in the eyes of others, murky if not suspect. In the 1970s, Congress became a site for the reimagining of a new American Indian identity for the Pascuayaki. While these efforts slightly predate the institutionalization of the contemporary U.S. federal acknowledgement process, Yaqui still found it necessary to perform a legible version of American Indianness. For instance, shortly after the bid for recognition, community leaders began to suggest that the Pascua Yaqui were descendants of the Toltec, the ancient predecessors to the Mexica Empire, and that much of what is now the United States, including Arizona, can be considered Toltec, and by association, Yaqui homeland. One cannot underestimate the significance of this narrative shift. Yaquis of Arizona had long understood their position in the region to be a product of relatively recent migration. Until the 1970s, no part of the present day American Southwest was explicitly included in community origin stories. So by incorporating Toltec heritage and US territory into their origins, Pascua Yaqui leaders were essentially staking a claim to a distinctly American Indian identity. Highlighting the deer dance was part of this larger attempt to represent the Pascua Yaquis as a quote unquote American Indian tribe. In September of 1977, Anselmo Valencia, a noted spiritual leader and architect of the Yaqui recognition campaign, went before the Senate Subcommittee on Indian Affairs with this very strategy in mind. Valencia characterized the dance as one of the most significant markers of the Yaqui's quote-unquote Indianness, and I'll quote his uh, statement to uh, the Senate at length here. Quote, the Yaqui's are Indian in every sense of the word. 
We have our own language, our own culture, such as the Pascola dancing, the deer dancing, and the coyote dancing. These dances are Indian in origin. In the deer dance, we sing to honor the great mountains, the springs, the lakes. We sing of our father, the sun, and of creatures living and dead. We sing of trees, leaves, and twigs. All of the songs sung and played are to the olden times, ancient Yaqui Indian stories. The Catholic faith and the various governments under which the Yaquis have had to suffer have tried for centuries to undermine our yaqui -ness. but after 400 years, they have not succeeded. We have retained our language, our culture, our Indianness." end quote. Valencia's conception of Indianness displays rhetoric that is typical of recognition proceedings. According to this logic, Yaqui identity can be reduced to select traits such as dances, language, songs, and stories. And these traits are imagined to have emerged in a distant past devoid of outside influence, i.e. prior to the arrival of the Catholic faith. Historians and sociologists of nationalism have long argued that the cultivation of symbols such as these are more than mere representations of ethnic communities. Rather, they are their constitutive elements in the formation of those communities. As described by Anthony D. Smith, the process of symbolic cultivation refers to a wide range of ethnic memories, symbols, myths, and traditions. Many of these are local in origin, but some of them may be taken up and adapted by specialists who then communicate these ideas to the world. Smith goes on to suggest that by operationalizing history and the social sciences in particular, uh, elite members of ethnic communities have worked to place their political projects on firm historical foundations and convince their kinsmen, as well as a hostile world of the truth of their claims. In the end, Valencia successfully persuaded sympathetic politicians, such as, Sen as Arizona Senator Dennis D. Cusini, to see Yaquis not as Mexican Indians, but as, and I'm quoting D. Cusini here, a, a major and unique American Indian tribe whose ancestors have lived in what we call the Southwest from time immemorial, end quote. In other words, operating under the strictures of recognition, Valencia effectively reassembled the Yaqui as a new kind of polity in the United States. Even after federal recognition was conferred, however, Yaqui identity remained an open question, especially at the local level, as real estate developers in Tucson began to turn their sites to the newly constructed site of New Pasqua, shown before. During the early 1960s, before recognition was an option, the Yaqui of Southern Arizona partnered with local applied anthropologists to lobby Congress to secure trust land for the community on the outskirts of Tucson. After purchasing a 320-acre plot of land, which was essentially a defunct mineral mining operation, the Yaqui, along with their anthropological patrons, established the Pascual Yaqui Development Project. Supported by the Office of Economic Opportunity, the bulwark of the war on poverty under the Johnson administration, the development project spurred the first wave of construction on what would become New Pasqua. The conferral of recognition in the late 1970s essentially turned New Pasqua from a somewhat poorly defined bit of federal trust land occupied by what many saw as Mexican descended Indians into an official tribal reservation. This reclassification ruffled the feathers of local stakeholders and revealed the inhospitality and the limits of liberal multiculturalism. When the tribe moved to expand their reservation boundaries in the early 1980s, in the early 1980s Joseph Cesar of Broadway Realty and Trust Inc wrote to Congressman and Pasquayaki supporter Morris K. Udall in protest, quote, there cannot be more than 100 Yaquis living on that reservation, who, by the way, came from Mexico, and it would be better to integrate them into our society instead of enlarging their reservation, end quote. Mexican refugees, American Indians, colonists, descendants of the Toltec, as the conference began, the Yaqui of Tucson were a newly recognized tribe still struggling to figure out how best to represent themselves to a somewhat hostile world under these newly codified conditions of American Indianness. Echoing the philosopher Ian Hacking, we might say that there was a two-way interaction between an emerging category of people, that is to say the Pascual Yaqui as an American Indian tribe, and the kinds of people, such as Valencia and other Yaqui folks, who would fit into this category. Valencia's congressional testimony I want to communicate was not the end of these interactions, but the beginning. The Yaqui Conference and the continued reframing of the deer dance as the paragon of Yaqui Indianness would prove to be another installment in this ongoing effort to live within the bounds of federal recognition. Now, in the spring of 1981, 
far removed from Southern Arizona and the political trials and tribulations of the Pasquayaki tribe, the Wintergren Foundation was busy formulating what would become the Yaki Conference. The conference planning process congealed amid a growing sense of disquiet in institutional anthropology, which rendered the future of cultural anthropologies or one of cultural anthropologies leading uh, sources of financial support in North America, deeply uncertain. Established in 1941 by the Swedish industrialist Axel Wenergren, the Wenergren Foundation began with the less than noble desire to shield its patrons' large financial holdings from a grading tax snafu, apparently involving the sale of a boat anchored off the coast of Florida, an elite problem if ever there was one. At the suggestion of his lawyers, Wenergren created the Viking Fund, the name supposedly inspired by his own Scandinavian heritage. While the organization asserted vague intellectual pretensions, initial projects in Latin America, such as developing a newspaper clipping service, appear to have been motivated largely by Wintergren's hope of extending his own business interest into the global south. It was only in the 1950s when Wintergren brought Paul Fejos, a Hungarian aristocrat and avant-garde filmmaker turned nascent social scientist into the organization as a director of research that the foundation eventually renamed in honor of its founder took on an explicitly anthropological, not to mention less superficial focus. Under Fayos's leadership, Wintergren became a leading patron of anthropology in the United States. And in 1957, Fayos persuaded Axel to purchase Berg Vortenstein, which then became the site of the recently established International Symposium series. The palatial estate and the symposia constituted intertwined symbols of the foundation's regal prominence in the field of anthropology. And this continued under the guidance of Fejos's widow, Lita, formerly Lita Bins and later Lita Osmondson, who officially and unofficially led the foundation and the symposium series until the mid 1980s. Under Osmondson's stewardship, the already distinguished and exclusive international symposium series took on a highly regimented character. Participants were sequestered and their social and intellectual interactions carefully managed through scheduled discussions, meals, and cocktail hours, which would take place over the course of about five days. Spouses and children were discouraged from accompanying invited participants. Local scholars who might be in the area and have an interest in a given event's theme were also barred from sitting in. Participants were required to pre-circulate their papers and attend each of the scheduled activities. Such mechanisms of control work to reconstitute the castle and the symposium series as authoritative sites for the construction of knowledge. By declaring which topics were worthy of discussion, providing the funds and space in which they could be examined, and controlling how conversations, both social and professional, occurred, the foundation was, to an extent, defining the parameters of acceptable anthropological inquiry and discourse. While not exactly constructing facts, Wenergren was certainly attempting to frame and guide the future intellectual doings of the field. And it appears to have done so with great success. As the foundation approached the bicentennial, Wenergren was popularly understood among US anthropologists to be a leading source of cultural anthropological funding and knowledge production. However, in the late 1970s, the foundation's rise to prominence was interrupted. Inflation and a shrinking endowment produced a crisis mentality within the organization that compelled the board of directors to ultimately uh, sell off Berg Wartenstein. The loss of the castle left future conferences and Wintergren's institutional identity in what Osmondson characterized as a state of limbo. The Yaki Conference was held in November of 1981, the year following the sale of the castle, and it offered the foundation a chance to reconfigure the symposium series for the future. According to the organizers of the event, the conference would serve as a quote-unquote mini-symposium, a test case for future gatherings. In an attempt to save the series that had lent her such great institutional clout, Osmondson became quite willing to loosen the reins on the berg wartenstein model. Participants would no longer be required to necessarily pre-circulate their papers, and in some instances to even provide papers at all. As planning progressed, the organizers also proved willing to allow participants to forgo the very basic requirement of attending all five days of the event. The Minius Symposium was to be a very different event indeed. Now, how exactly the Yaki and their deer dance became the central focus of the 89th Symposium is rather elusive. Planning did not begin with a specific eye towards the Yaki or really even Arizona. Rather, the idea for the conference began as a multi-city tour in which eight distinct cultures and their unique performances would be enacted for participants, 
The Yaki had been discussed as one of many possible case studies to include since the early stages of the planning process. However, none of the primary organizers had much familiarity with this borderlands people. The initial co-organizers were Victor Turner, the famed interpretive anthropologist of ritual, and Richard Schechner, a well-respected performance studies scholar. Despite both their noted intellectual resumes, neither man had much familiarity with Yaki's. Similarly, Willa Apel, the appointed project director for the conference, had expertise in other areas. At the time, she would have been best known as an anthropologist of cults, exploring cult ideologies and leadership practices. For Turner, Schechter, and Apel, Yaki's were something of a mystery. After a brief scouting trip to Tucson, however, in March of 1981, Apel decided to downsize the foundation's rather ambitious plans for the conference. There would be two main conferences under the subject of performance and ritual held in New York close to the foundation's base of operations in 1982. In addition to these events, the organizers would hold a test case in Arizona with the Yaki Deer Dance as the intellectual focal point. The organizers ambitiously decided to hold the Yaki segment of this series in November of 81, leaving them with a scant six months to organize the event. Typically, symposium required somewhere between 10 to 12 months of planning minimum. At this point, the organizers still had no official contact with the Yaki of Tucson. There was more work to be done. In September of 81, a mere two months before the conference was to be held, April attempted to remedy this problem by returning to Tucson with Osmondson in tow to meet with Edward and Rosamond Spicer, the Pasquayaki Tribal Council, and Anselmo Valencia, mentioned before. Now the Spicers, both of whom were anthropologists, had been fixtures in Pasquayaki affairs since the mid-1930s, when they arrived to pursue ethnographic research as graduate students from the University of Chicago. Edward, in particular, made the Pasquayaki a primary object of analysis until his death in 1983, shortly after the conference. Both Edward and Rosamond were also active participants in Yaki cultural and political affairs throughout this period starting with very small attempts, but consequential to secure financial support for the deer dance and other Yaki ceremonies from city coffers in Tucson. Edward had been one of also Valencia's primary collaborators during the 1960s as part of the effort to create new Pasqua. He had also provided expert testimony to Congress in 1977 in support of Valencia's bid for recognition. At the time of the conference, the Spicers had a 44-year-old relationship with the Yaquis of Tucson, made stronger by their long-term residence in the city and Edward, Edward's position in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Arizona, also in Tucson. So they, they stayed in Tucson, they raised their family in Tucson. Oddly, though, it appears that Turner, Schechter, and Apel had not thought to include the Spicers in their event until a proposed participant, Fred Egan from the University of Chicago, made the suggestion in the summer of 81. Osmondson and company scrambled to digest Edward's work and the recent history of the Yaki in Tucson. The conference organizers' behavior suggests not only a lack of familiarity with Yaki's, but a somewhat naive understanding of the political terrain that they would enter. Following their September meeting, Osmondson asked Spicer for a copy of his 1977 testimony before Congress. She planned to circulate the statement to the invited participants, the majority of whom also had little to no experience with Yaki issues. Osmondson stated that she had heard that the expert testimony was, quote, the most cogent information they could obtain as preparation for this conference, end quote. What Osmondson did not realize was that Spicer's testimony was really a carefully crafted and abbreviated attempt to represent the cultural distinctiveness and territorial attachments of the Yaqui to Arizona so as to underwrite their claim to American Indian tribal identity. The claims made in the testimony were more conjectural and politically pragmatic than they were rooted in empirical research. So Spicer had this large canon of work that they could have drawn from peer reviewed articles and texts, but this was the object that they were focused on. By embracing this testimony, I think the foundation betrayed a simplified conception of the complexities of recognition in the Yaki case, um, could be an underestimation on my part. Ultimately, the Spicers agreed to attend the conference and provide commentary on the preliminary program, which Osmondson actually credited with quote unquote, yakiizing the issues. Additionally, Edward consented to be listed as a co-organizer, giving the gathering some semblance of local anthropological support and approval. Despite the Spicers' aid, the organizers did recognize that yakiizing the proceedings would still at some point require the involvement of actual yakis. <clears throat> 
This realization marked the formal introduction of Anselmo Valencia into the planning process. A World War II veteran, community organizer, dynamic political advocate, Valencia was far from the unassuming shamanic caricature of Don Juan popularly portrayed in Carlos Castaneda's writings on Yaqui spirituality, which would have been popular at this point. Valencia was also no stranger to anthropology, and this is important. During the 1930s and 40s, Valencia's ceremonial godfather, Lucas Chavez, served as one of Edward Spicer's primary informants. Chavez, a keen political mind in his own right, was one of the first to recognize how sympathetic anthropologists could be made to serve as advocates for the Yaqui in their dealings with local government. Beginning in the late 1940s, Valencia elaborated on this strategy in his own campaigns. The Spicers once again became nodes of advocacy as Valencia relied on Edward to secure support from congressional representatives and federal funding agencies, such as the Office of Economic Opportunity. These efforts helped manifest Pasquayaki recognition and a tribal reservation, which in turn elevated Valencia's position in the community as a skilled organizer and well-connected political operator. However, nearing the rocky foundation of Wenergren by the early 1980s, Valencia's position had also begun to change. As already noted, the newly recognized Pasquayaki tribe faced opposition from segments of the local real estate lobby. However, this was not all. The recognition campaign had put Valencia on somewhat confrontational terms with other Yaqui groups who opposed his decision to speak for them as if they were a single homogeneous entity. The people of Pasqua were one of several Yaqui communities in the state. Additionally, leading up to recognition, Valencia faced criticism from more powerful recognized tribes of Arizona who viewed the Yaqui as Mexican, not American Indians with illegitimate claims to already limited federal resources. Faced with opposition on multiple fronts, Valencia entered the conference with a need to present the Pasquayaki to the public as a legitimate and coherent indigenous entity. Now, unaware of this situation, April wrote to Valencia following their short meeting in Tucson, quote, we depend on you to decide how to present the issues. Our goal is to learn about the deer dance and its place in Yaqui culture. We hope that you will continue to teach us how best to learn, end quote. Fortunately for Valencia, teaching how best to learn would conform quite nicely with his own goals and objectives. On the morning of November 19th, 1981, the first official day of the conference, tribal representatives greeted participants at New Pasqua and gave their visitors a tour of the facilities before a formal welcome led by Valencia began promptly at 11.30 a.m. The welcoming speech is recounted in participant Edith Turner's reflections. Quote, Valencia began by introducing the dancers. Then he turned to his listeners and reminded them that they were Anglos, anthropologists, and that he had a lot of trouble from anthropologists. Their incessant questions made it very difficult for the Yaquis. Valencia strode up and down a little, getting indignant. What is this word savage, he asked, a word that Anglos and Mexicans used about the Yaquis. He asked various people in the audience what the word meant. After some unsatisfying responses from Victor Turner and Edward Spicer, Valencia went on to give the definition that he had heard from Anglos, that savages were murderous before anything else, end quote. It was at this point that Valencia began to frame his audience's perception of the deer dance, what they were there for. Valencia recounted uh, the origins of the ceremonial objects on display before his audience. From flutes to drums, he claimed an indigenous origin for each. Valencia even suggested that the Yaqui's symbolic use of the cross had pre-colonial, i.e. non-Christian roots, the cross being part of the Yaqui flag. Later in his summary of Yaqui history, Valencia emphasized a cunning embrace of colonial society in which Yaqui selectively pruned and incorporated elements of Catholicism while retaining their distinct religion. Echoing his performance before Congress, Valencia framed the deer dance as an untouched vestige of a pre-colonial past. This presentation departed significantly from the ethnographic and ethnohistorical literature at the time, much of which had been produced by Spicer, who was present for this performance. And in his notes from the conference, Spicer expressed discomfort as he characterized Valencia's interpretation as, quote unquote, idiosyncratic. While the organizers worked to transpose aspects of the Berg-Bortenstein model to the Arizona location over the next few days, contingencies reigned supreme. The second day of the conference saw a return to the reservation with Valencia once again acting as master of ceremonies while participants witnessed an abbreviated performance of the deer dance organized specifically for the conference. 
The third day brought Valencia to a conference center located 40 miles north of Tucson in the town of Oracle, a more traditional setting somewhat reminiscent of the berg wardenstein days, although arguably less, less regal. Four different sessions were scheduled between 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m., with Valencia serving as the primary discussant for the opening session. This session was to be chaired by Keith Basso, an expert on the Western Apaches, who reluctantly accepted the invitation, admitting his lack of familiarity with the Yaki case. But Basso missed the first two days of the conference, rendering him unable to speak specifically about the Deer Dance presentation or Valencia's commentary. The session was also intended to be based on a pre-circulated paper by Alfonso Ortiz, another anthropologist of the Southwest. But Ortiz canceled just prior to the start of the conference due to a family emergency. With an unaware chair and an absent presenter, this left a gaping hole in the start of the day, one that Valencia was more than capable of filling. From this position as discussant, Valencia made a somewhat lateral move, choosing to discuss and critique Edward Spicer's ethnographic portrayals of the Yaki. Now, the core of Valencia's comments are not well remembered by participants, nor is it clearly stated in the documentary record. It's very likely, however, that the differing conceptions of Yaki origins and the sacredness of the deer dance were probably at play. As noted already, Valencia increasingly portrayed the community as having a primordial connection to the area that is now known as Southern Arizona. Now, over the course of his career, Spicer progressively pushed the date of Yaki arrival in the region further and further back. However, he never endorsed, endorsed an autochthonous narrative. Relatedly, the year before the conference, Spicer published his epic cumulative monograph, The Yaki's A Cultural History. And part of this book addressed the absorption of the deer dance into the tourist industries of Arizona and Sonora, which did very little to support Valencia's depiction of the dance as a radically other institution free of colonial or settler influence. Now, we might not know the precise nature of the conflict that emerged between Valencia and Spicer on that day. However, I think we can see that Valencia was using the event as an opportunity to eclipse dominant anthropological interpretations of the deer dance, as well as Yaki history and culture more generally. What Spicer dubbed idiosyncratic can be more accurately understood as an emergent depiction of Yaki-ness shaped by the demands of federal recognition. In the aftermath of the event, Valencia continued to cultivate the deer dance as a symbol of Yaki-ness, and Wendergren continued to be part of this process, or at least it tried. With the encouragement from Osmondson, Valencia submitted an application to the foundation for a grant that would help fund a book project about the ritual. Because of his participation in the conference, the application was given somewhat preferential treatment despite being improperly filled out. Essentially, Valencia left the majority of the application blank. The section reserved for a one and a half page description of the aim and scope of the project contained a single sentence. In her response to Valencia, Osmondson insisted that, quote, the application is short on words, but succinct in intent. It is fine as is because what you would finally do is what will have a deeper meaning, end quote. Despite her expressed enthusiasm and confidence, Osmond said contacted the Spicer soon after receiving the application, asking one or both of them to not only write a letter of support, but to summarize the project for grant readers. She wrote, quote, Anselmo, fin Anselmo finally applied. Given the cultural problems, his application is understandable. End quote. I've often wondered, what were these cultural problems that would have prevented Valencia from filling out the application in Osmondson's mind? Valencia was new to the Wenner system, sure, but was this a matter of reaching across vast cultural divides? Hardly. At this point, Valencia was clearly no stranger to U.S. bureaucracy and definitely no stranger to anthropology. What at first appears to be Osmondson's own limited understanding of the Yaki, I think is actually representative or evidence of the success of Valencia's performance during the conference. He had presented the tribe in a radically other light. Osmondson, not unlike Senator D. Cusini before her, appears to have not questioned this depiction. Now, in his final days of a losing battle with cancer, Edward Spicer jotted down his thoughts on the Yaki conference and sent them off to Osmondson. This was a common practice for Wenner post symposia where people would be asked to write up their reflections on the event. And this would usually serve as the foundation for an edited volume that would then follow the event. Spicer noted various issues, including, and I'll quote from uh, different uh, portions of his letter, including a lack of a sense of common understanding as to the purpose of the conference, which left him with a persistent sense of not communicating that bothered him and constituted a disappointment. 
Uh, but despite these drawbacks, Spicer identified at least one area in which he felt the conference to be an unmitigated success. Quote, the first two days of the conference marked an important new kind of event during which the conference was sponsored by Yaki singers, dancers on behalf of the Yaki community of Pascua Pueblo. This inaugurated a constructive kind of relationship between scholars and Indians. The Yaki's involved planned and carried out the presentation of a performance and a spoken introduction for the visitors and made their selection from the deer ritual without prompting from scholars. Undoubtedly, the Wendergren Conference established a new model which Yaki's will seek to duplicate in the future in their relationship with all seeking to study Yaki culture." End quote. While the event might have marked a change in Yaki anthropological relations insofar as the Yaki took on a more active role in the conference, the performance carried out over the course of those five days, I want to emphasize, did not emerge de novo. As I have already illustrated, Valencia's cultivation of the deer dance as a primary symbol of Yaki-ness and Indianness was part of an ongoing attempt to represent Yaki's as a certain kind of people, an American Indian tribe. The Yaki comes the means of carrying out this performance beyond the halls of Congress. That is to say, the conference served as more than just a mere test case for a floundering anthropological institution grasping for life. It constituted an unexpected but palpable terrain upon which the vexing politics of recognition could be negotiated, contested, and confirmed. Now, ultimately, I think the Yaki Conference is just one side of analysis for understanding how recognition comes to inflect non-governmental domains of social life. Increasingly, anthropologists and other academics knowingly and actively engage the politics of recognition in unexpected places. Formal land acknowledgments and welcome to country introductions are perhaps two of the most common examples that anthropologists encounter at conferences in the current moment, even if we're not there in person, even in the virtual uh, conferences and um, webinars we attend. My suspicion is that these relatively recent academic rituals are part of a different sort than the kinds of engagements with recognition that define the Yaki conference. At the very least, those who perform land acknowledgments today do so in a way that is more, well in, well, uh, more uh, intentional and well-informed than the Yaki conference organizers. Just the other day, I was fortunate to attend a webinar on land acknowledgments geared toward community college faculty in the Southwest. The event was intended to teach faculty about the history and purpose of land acknowledgments so that they might incorporate this emergent practice into their teaching. The presenter emphasized the need to learn about the people whose land one seeks to acknowledge so as to avoid uh, quote unquote vanilla recognition. Compared to the otherwise lackluster institutional recognition of the histories of conquest and settlement that had given rise to settler nation states, this appears to me to be a largely positive development. However, I think it's worth considering how these emergent traditions are never divorced from the demands of recognition, and this includes the ideologies that undergird such politics. Might there be instances, for example, in which the rhetorical and iterative association of native groups with discrete territories unintentionally exacerbates and naturalizes Euro-American conceptions of land and peoplehood, which have rendered the claims of people such as the Yaki suspect to begin with? When I asked the presenter at the aforementioned webinar why the Yaki were not included in many of the land acknowledgments used by universities and colleges in the Tucson area, I was told rather simply that the Yaki are native to Northern Mexico not the United States. I cannot help but consider how such an answer, well-intentioned and well-supported by the documentary record though it may be, effectively naturalizes the logics of recognition that Valencia and Yaquis of Arizona have struggled to live within. I have no immediate answers or solution to the vexing paradoxes of recognition. I don't want to uh, communicate the idea that I'm suggesting that we should say like not do land acknowledgments, for instance, not that at all. I simply hope that scholars will keep such paradoxes in mind as we continuously and critically document the dynamics of recognition in places expected and unexpected. And that would be it. Yeah. All right, that was, that was terrific. Thank you, uh, Nick, that was great fun. Um, I think while we check in on the questions, can I start with one? Um, a lot, a lot of different things come to mind, but uh, the first the biggest question I had was, you uh, you mentioned a little bit uh, the the quest for federal recognition and the way that the Spicers were involved in that, and I'm curious to what extent did the kind of dynamics you described for the Wenner Grand Symposium uh, mirror or diverge from 
the that other quest for rec that other venue of recognition that that I know you also have studied. Uh, sure, I, I think that's a, that's a great question. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so to think about the two, so as I sort of mentioned at the outset, um, the the campaign for recognition and then this sort of uh, little known conference sort of coincide. They're only a few years apart, certainly. Um, there's definitely some parallels with that. So as I mentioned, the uh, at least Edward Spicer took on something of a role in the federal recognition campaign, not particularly an active role. Spicer was sort of a, a late addition to that uh, development. Spicer had worked, labored pretty hard throughout the 1960s to do everything that he could, along with a couple of other local anthropologists in the Tucson area to ensure that the Yaki were able to take advantage of some of the resources that I mentioned were being offered through the Office of Economic Opportunity, so essentially the war on poverty. Um, that was not unique to the Yaki. Other uh, federally recognized Native groups were able to do that throughout the 1960s. Uh, so Spicer had devoted his attention to that. Recognition was something that seems to have developed sort of apart from his involvement with the community. And it wasn't really until a few years into that in around the 1976, 1977, that the lawyers working with the what would become the Pasquayaki Tribal Council reached out to Spicer and asked him to write a formal letter of support, which essentially became the kind of sole expert witness testimony, you might say, that was used uh, when the Yaki went before Congress. And that's really just a, a few pages of a statement, uh, an attempt by Spicer to sort of summarize at that point, which would have been, you know, 30 plus years worth of work. And, you know, it as I try to mention there in the, the talk around the conference, that testimony that Spicer put together tries to do something, uh, tries to walk a very difficult line, which is that it's trying to sort of speak to the uh, cultural and historical integrity of the Yaki as a discrete community, uh, but at the same time trying not to necessarily uh, support and naturalize these autochthonous claims that are starting to sort of permeate within Yaki politics in Southern Arizona. So there's uh, a little bit of trepidation on Spicer's part to both be involved in some ways in the Yaki conference, but also in the Yaki campaign for recognition, which I think is an interesting parallel. At first, Spicer is sort of uh, reluctant to write any such testimony that would then be used for the recognition uh, campaign, uh, but ultimately uh, decides to do it sort of recognizing his long-term attachment to the community and the people that he had worked on behalf of. Spicer recognized that really with the introduction of the Nixon administration, any and all hope that they had to continue to exhaust the resources of the war on poverty was you know, next to none. The Nixon administration essentially stopped that dead in its tracks uh, for everybody with the exception of a few uh, programs like Head Start that continued on. But for the Yaki, there really was, once we get to the early 1970s, no other option. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks for this great talk, Nick. I'm not sure I've got a question. It, it just seems to me that what you've described is a the kind of leading edge of what became uh, a set of dilemmas associated with federal recognition, which, as you know, is famously difficult. Um, and one of the problems is, for, so for example, groups like the Pueblo, because they've occupied the same space you know, for millennia, don't have, um, I don't think I've ever had a hard time proving their authenticity, if you will and the, the cultural continuity, but um, groups that for whatever complicated reason, either migration or uh, if you, I'm thinking now more about groups in the Northeast um, who had lots of reasons to hide their native uh, identity like the Abenaki and, um, and others are faced with this dilemma, which is when, it be, when there comes a moment that they feel more comfortable to assert their identity and, and engage in the federal recognition process, they don't look like Indians um, to the general population because they, for, for and completely understandable reasons, they've really had to minimize that aspect of their culture. And so the, the becomes this huge um, focus on performativity. And what's spectacular about the Yaki, and I know um, Spicer's book, his description of the Easter ritual very well because I used it um, I used it's one of the few cases in the anthropological record that I'm familiar with in which somebody describes a ritual at great length, but without um, a lot of interpretive um, baggage, uh, which he provides at the end. So I would use it as a case study, hand it out to my students, and I'd say, make sense of this. And of course, completely blew their minds because it's such an amazing ritual. Um, but uh, 
that you know that the focus on the deer dance that you refer to is an example of what then later became the kinds of issues that say Jim Clifford writes about famously in, in the study of the Wampanoags uh, efforts to be federally recognized you know where um, and, and in my own work in South America you know in the 1970s I worked with the Awahun Ahibaron people in northeastern Peru and it was very unusual at that point to see Awahun wearing traditional dress um, and 15 or 20 years later in public forums, they always, um, I mean, women wear the traditional tarahi or, you know, um, dress and uh, feather earrings. And so that the perform performance of indigeneity had become, I think this is a global phenomenon, become absolutely essential to the kinds of assertions that, um, that indigenous people have been making. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I think that's what you've described as one of the leading edges of and, and the kinds of dilemmas that that presents to anthropologists. So on the one hand, as as we move more towards advocacy and perhaps a sense of guilt for having been more distanced documentarians without real engagement with the communities, um, were opening themselves to the indigenous people's own views of what they um who they were and what they believed, and yet those views were sometimes very much uh, contradicted by the kind of evidence that anthropologists had collected over time. So anyway, I guess the long-winded way of uh, saying what uh, what do you think the implications of the Winter Gren conference were um, over you know in the subsequent decades of the of the discipline? Um, no, I, I think that's. So I, I agree with all the, the all the framing that you uh, you know set up for that question. I would yeah add other you know we could look at other case studies from not just the sure. United States, but as you're pointing out beyond uh, beyond uh, North America that would fall into that as well. One of the things that I didn't really get time to talk about in, in this sort of presentation of the paper, but there is a sort of a more elaborate uh, article version of it, which should be coming out in the the next issue of the Histories of Anthropology Annual uh, when that volume comes out, in which I sort of speculate on what might this event have sort of meant for Wenergren long term? Because as I try to frame it is that this kind of comes at this sort of uh, uh, inflection point. I very I hesitate to use that term since it's, it's so horribly abused during the elections, but it is an inflection point for institutional anthropology, at least for Wenergren at that point in time. And my suspicion is sort of based on what they were hoping to do with that conference and then sort of the way the symposia continued to develop thereafter is that they, there was um, one of the things that Wenergren would, would typically do, I sort of mentioned it very briefly, is that they would ask participants to sort of write up their reflections on the event. And that ostensibly that was to be used to create the groundwork for an edited volume that would come out of it. But sometimes it was also to be as a, a corrective, things that went right, things that didn't go right. And there's most of the participants in the Yaki conference do not respond to that request. A lot of people, when I would try to contact folks who uh, did participate in the conference, uh, those that are still with us kind of vaguely remembered it. Um, they remembered that there's a sort of little tiff between Valencia and Spicer, um, but maybe they didn't attend all the days, so not a whole lot is in there. But there are a few more detailed reflections from people who did seem to be there for all of the days of the conference. And they're pretty critical of, uh, in particular, Valencia's performance, and they kind of see him as sort of taking hold of the event um, it sort of kind of betrays, I think, some of their own preconceived notions about what a proper indigenous, you know, representative should be doing, not necessarily using this as a space for their politics, which, you know, I, how it could have been anything else. I don't know how people would have suspected that. Uh, but basically, they kind of flag some of those comments, uh, Willa Apel and Osmondson, and they kind of use that as a sort of suggestion that maybe moving forward, we don't want to open up this sort of cornerstone of our institutional identity to non-academics, to the public. And if you really look at the symposia series moving forward, because it does sort of land on its feet. Of course, it's never, as far as I know, held again at Berg Bordenstein. But if you look at the locations that most of the symposium have been held at ever since you know, the early 1980s, it tends to still be pretty secluded, elite locations. For the most part, it's academics at Research One universities. Some people would argue that it's even a smaller pool of people really more focused on you know, the Northeast um, in terms of those universities. And there are instances in which Wendergren does support other types of uh, events that are not part of the symposia series, which sort of invites 
non-academics um, into it, but those have been pretty few and far between. And I can't help but wonder if the experience of the Yaki Conference might not have had something to do with that, because in the lead up to it, there is a pretty big emphasis from Osmondson and others is that, well, this is not an ideal situation, but perhaps we can create a new framework moving forward. And perhaps the best thing to do is to open ourselves up to the public. And it doesn't really seem to be that uh, that has been the sort of the, the bread and butter of Wintergren, not knocking Wintergren necessarily, because of course yeah. they're they're not alone in this. Yeah, well, I, I must say that I participated in several of those symposia post the period you're talking about. I think starting about a decade later. And um, one thing that I'll never forget, and I was still fairly young then, is that they have a giant logbook. Do you know, do you know about this? that everyone who's participated in one of these has signed. And so there's a kind of ritual signing where you get to look at the pages and see that, you know, there was Claude Levi-Strauss and Edmund Leach and, you know, Victor Turner and, and, and Margaret Mead and, and all the rest. And so you're, you're inscribing your name in this log book of the, you know, the ancestors of, of anthropology. And so as a kind of occupational identity formation experience, it's, I personally found it very, I mean, humbled on the one hand, but, but uh, inspiring uh, on the other. Paul? Uh, we have a question from David Dinwoody at UNM. Uh, your paper represents an interesting blend of contemporary analysis and the history of anthropology. Can you speak to what you are trying to do with the history of anthropology? That's very nice of David to pose that question. Uh, who's also on my <laughs> dissertation committee and has been a, a great supporter. Um, I, I have many thoughts about sort of the history of anthropology as its own field of inquiry. Um, I think that there, you know, there definitely been different sort of uh, strains uh, or different sort of uh, variations of that since I don't know where people want to begin, if they want to begin with Hallowell or Stocking or whomever uh, as the sort of, uh, as the sort of origin point for it. But I, I do think that I, I see at least kind of two tendencies two general tendencies in the history of anthropology right now, um, which is that many people are very much interested in sort of these uh, critical analysis of the history of the discipline, which sometimes in its more reductive light kind of turns into this, uh, the, the kind, of, kind of pushing out of tropes that we've all heard before without a whole lot of empirical analysis behind them. Anthropology is a child of empire. Anthropology is a handmaid of colonialism. We all know these ones, but those tend to not be followed by a whole lot of empirical event-based analysis. On the other side of that, though, we also have plenty of other folks who are more interested in the history of anthropology. I think being this kind of, uh, you know, if not like ancestor worship, there's a certain deification that goes on there, a hagiography more so than it is maybe uh, a history of the relationship between science and politics. Um, again, I'm kind of, it's very reductive, but I think those two camps are very much present. Um, and I think they both have great things to offer. I'm more concerned with thinking about the history of anthropology as the co-construction of science and politics and trying to sort of leverage what we can from the history and sociology of science, which I think has done a slightly better job of sort of framing our interest in our own disciplinary histories which means that we don't necessarily have to be in the business of, you know, trying to validate or invalidate things like anthropology's relationship with colonialism or those sort of like handmade in tropes. Rather, we can actually look at, in this case, what I'm trying to do is really sort of concrete event-based analyses so that if we can talk about, say, anthropology is implicating the politics of recognition, right? That's a very easy statement for me to make. That's a very easy statement for anybody to make actually showing people how that unfolds in time and place, that's what I'm interested in. I think history of anthropology as a field of inquiry really is well positioned to do that because as we know, anthropology as a discipline is implicated in these different historical political formations, imperialism, colonialism, recognition, you know, settler colonialism, what have you. Um, so pushing it into, I, I wanna see actual people in real time, in real place, historical actors doing things, talking to each other, essentially. Um, we've got a question or a comment and a comment and a question from uh, Louise Lamphere, who I'm sure you also know. Um, she writes, while Nick characterizes Wintergren in the late 1970s and 80s as a floundering organization, it's worth thinking about this period as one where Wintergren was responding to and perhaps shaping a lot of changes in anthropology. 
Um, I, at about the same time in 1982, it hosted a seminar on the roles of women, including some Native women, in the shaping of anthropology. This was a seminar with all women participants, a, a huge change from the more male-driven conferences at the castle, with lots of informal interactions that were focused on the maleness of the participants. Could Nick comment on that? Well, I appreciate Louise pointing that out. Yeah, I, I think that's a great observation to make. And I, I do think, yeah, moving forward, you know, Wintergren it doesn't really take too much time. I think in their own, if you go through the, the Wintergren archives uh, from, you know, like 1979 to 1981, I think they're almost making too much of a big deal about the sort of crisis mentality. You know, I, I mentioned that, that that's a quote from one of Osmondson's. Uh, memos that she sends out to others within the organization. They're very concerned, not just with the financial side of things, but Osmondson also writes uh, a couple of things about how the uh, the sort of traditional four field approach to anthropology that Wintergren in some respects had been invested in seems to be sort of dissipating as anthropologists become more interested in sort of interdisciplinary analysis. And you actually see that sort of transformation play out in the history of the symposium, where you start to get more and more non-anthropologists that are participating in it, even before this sort of, you know, crisis inflection point. And I think, uh, you know, pointing out, yeah, pretty much everything, if you look at the symposium series, uh, what comes uh, in the remainder of the 1980s, it's pretty amazing stuff. Um, so I think Luis is, uh, you know, more than right to point out, not just uh, uh, the involvement, if we're talking about like Native folks and women, but also even the, you know, the turn and the embrace of uh, history. And we sort of see that intersection with uh, anthropology. And Wintergren is once again sort of at the, at the forefront of that. Um, so yeah, emphasizing the Wintergren sort of being a, a floundering institution at that point in time uh, is not to say that, you know, Wintergren never comes out of that or doesn't do anything significant that doesn't have impact or implications in the field, um, especially since, I mean, if you're a cultural anthropologist today and you're not applying to Wintergren for something, like, you know, I, I probably don't have to say it because you are, right? It is still a, a central point in the, in the field and, and for very good reasons. So I hope that, I hope that at least addresses or, uh, the, the point that Luis was uh, raising. Yeah, including us at SAR, right, Michael? Um, yeah, uh, this is really fun stuff to think with. I, I'm curious, uh, as a as a student of Michel Rolf Truyot, I always think about his his insight that every historical narrative that there's a present in the past, right? That it also reflects the the interests of that political moment, and I think you've you've sort of uncovered that without without calling it that in your close reading of this particular symposium, that, that there are political interests of that moment at play in what becomes a story that's ostensibly about the past, but in fact also reflects the present. And I'm curious whether you've found that uh, Rolf's paradigm helpful in thinking about this sort of thing, or whether you're perhaps more working through um, some some other paradigms like a stocking you mentioned george stocking's work uh or 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 i'm not sure what other paradigms uh ha have been the most helpful to you so that's that's the question oh no that's that's uh great i mean i think um so i mean the short answer would be i find trio is very useful for thinking about not just for bringing a historical perspective into anthropology to talk about the past and the present or the silences that are woven throughout our narratives all of those sort of like really productive uses of constructionist you know theory and sort of uh, the melding together of, uh, of Foucault of Hayden White all of those things that come through in Trio's work is I think incredibly productive um, and I do find that inspiring and useful for thinking about the history of the discipline, which of course Trio is talking about in addition to many other things, history itself. Uh, I, the thing about, uh, I think the, the sort of stocking uh, uh, variant of the history of anthropology that I find very useful, and I think on some level this, uh, this paper is representative of is that I think, you know, people tend to, you know, overly, I think, associate stocking with the emphasis on historical paradigms and trying to make sense and use the Kuhnian framework to bring it to the history of anthropology. And people can, you know, you know, bring their hands on that for decades to come. I have no interest in it. Um, but what the thing that I think that stocking did, did give us that is still very useful to think with is to think about the history of anthropology through the history of institutions, 
right? Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think is very important and useful for giving us a, a side of analysis. So that's where Wendergren becomes, you know, particularly useful and important for trying to make sense of this conference, but also the ways in which anthropology's history is sort of embedded within or entangled in the, the history of the Pasquayaki tribe. So I don't know if that provides like a, a very succinct answer to the question that you pose, but I, you know, for me, it's, it doesn't have to be necessarily a one or the other when we're trying to look through uh, sort of previous paradigms and ways to conceptualize the, the history of anthropology. I think there's things that we can uh, choose and take with us, even going back to somebody like, you know, Hallowell, um, which I think sometimes doesn't always, always get its, you know, uh, its due for thinking about the history of the discipline, the study of the history of the discipline, I should say. Uh, um, if I could follow up, uh, uh, I don't mean to take over, but, um, you know, I wonder, this crisis, I haven't read the documents from Wintergren, but the crisis that of the foundation that they did that you've described in their own reporting. I wonder if that sort of uh, has to do with the crisis of the uh, of that time with again what Rolf Trio talked about in terms of the savage slot. I mean, it's the end of an era where you could where anthropologists could self confidently study quote unquote savages to find new peoples to describe and so forth. And it was a crisis of confidence that obviously led pretty directly to stuff like writing culture and, uh, and uh, the, the more reflexive turn of anthropology later in that decade. And so I'm curious whether you, having read those documents, whether you saw that those crises as, entered, as entangled or, or it was something very distinct to that institution, speaking of institutional histories uh, no, that, yeah yeah no i think i think the thing that you're pointing to is yeah i was kind of wondering when i started to see that there was more of these memos going back and forth between osmondson and her team which seemed to suggest that something was going on within the institution that they needed to fix if they were going to survive not just this financial crisis but this lar the larger sort of symbolic position of the foundation within the field of anthropology and i thought maybe this would be especially if you know you look at a timeline for it oh this is the crisis of representation right this yeah. is all the things that sort of open up the floodgates to clifford and marcus and all these other folks were not a result though people who are obviously working before this um, but it seemed to be at least the things that are mentioned explicitly in some of those memos, it doesn't really seem to, to get quite into, it doesn't quite explicitly address, I think, some of the, the politics and concerns that you're talking about, of, you, know, you know, sort of the, the issues of representation and speaking for other folks. It seems to be that that's something that's kind of implied in the background. And it's hard for me to tell because it's just reading it, you know, from the point of view of the present. I know that that's something that's going on and other people are concerned with, but it does seem to be, at least in the documentation that I was finding, from Osmondson and folks is that the concerns seem to be more around things like uh, the validity of the four field approach, which mm. I was kind of surprised to see that that was being something that was being emphasized uh, as hard as it was. And I don't know if that was in some ways sort of a, a euphemism for talking about these other things that you're pointing to, because in the same time, it's more of concern that people are kind of uh, not really respecting disciplinary borders and boundaries anymore. And I don't know if that is also, again, hard not to think is that people from outside of the discipline rendering their own critiques, again, thinking of somebody like I already mentioned before, James Clifford's work, hard to say exactly, but it's, you know, it seems like it's sort of um, in the ether, at least in terms of that quote unquote crisis mentality and concern for what the future of the foundation might be. Mm -hmm. But I think they're kind of overstating it in some of the documents, because you go back and you look at these previous list of participants in the symposia, and it's like, you know, Irving Goffman was there, all these performance state, Schechner and um, uh, Victor Turner, who I point out were sort of the original uh, organizers of this event, they had met at a previous symposium. So it wasn't necessarily like, again, I feel like some of the concern in the documentation, they're almost uh, or sort of overstating the, the transformative nature of this moment, which maybe has reflected or kind of rubbed off in my own narrative of it as well. Well, Nick, we've uh, we've gone past the 60 minute mark, so perhaps it's time to wind this down. But I just want to thank you for an unforgettable talk. And, you know, it's funny, there are a lot of Santa Fe characters that uh, appear in your narrative. I mean, um, Alfonso Ortiz, obviously, who, you know, finished his life in Santa Fe and Fred Egan retired to Santa Fe. And um, so Barbara there are people. Tedlock. Uh, the, Tedlock. Barbara, the, the Tedlocks, absolutely. Um, and so it's sort of interesting to see how, and in some ways, the advanced seminar uh, program at SAR was inspired by Winter Grand, though the model's somewhat different. They're much smaller than Winter Grand. They're on our campus. We don't fly everybody to Italy or Spain or Brazil or the kinds of places that they go or used to go. 
uh, and we certainly have never had a castle. Uh, <laughs> it's an adobe castle, I guess. Um, but certainly that was um, one of the models that I'm sure that Doug Schwartz was was following when he uh, he created the advanced seminar program. And we've had similarly, uh, you know, important moments of rethinking things like the fall of the Maya and, and indigeneity and a whole host of other issues that develop out of these seminars. Anyway, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. My only regret is that you can't be here in Santa Fe because uh, normally the Adams Fellow does spend uh, t time on our campus, but for obvious reasons, uh, that wasn't possible, but we appreciate the work that you've done. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Yeah, thanks for, yeah. to everybody for joining us too. Look, next time you're in town, look us up. <laughs>